Technotopia, we're going to do something different. I usually I talk about startups, usually I talk about uh, stuff like that, but today I'm going to talk about the future, which is kind of like about startups, but it's superior in every way because nothing really has to happen by talking about it. So this is all my information. Uh, this East Coast editor, TechCrunch. I'm an oh Jesus, come on, entrepreneur. I'm a writer. I'm very tired uh, all the time, exhausted most of the time. Uh, at John Biggs, you can tweet me at John Biggs. You can email me John at TechCrunch if you have specific startup questions. And these are my books, John Biggs books. I just recently wrote a book about Maria Antoinette's watch. Uh, I write fiction and nonfiction, all kinds of other good stuff. And I'm writing a book now called Technotopia. So everybody thinks that when you, in the next 20 years, we're going to end up in a hell, hellscape, essentially. We're all going to be dead, and it's going to be terrible, and the earth is going to burn into crisp, and uh, all of our children are going to be born with three heads, and we're all going to have, uh, be controlled by some master AI that's going to destroy us. Would, would, is that, we have a dystopian vision of the future, yes? Would you argue that? It's not going to get any better, right? And you guys are Poles, so you guys always think that. Yes? Is everybody's, let's just be happy. We're just, I, it's, it's only like five of us in here, so we just, let's, we'll, just, we'll just chat. Louder. Here, wait. Okay. Yeah, let's close the door. So in the future, we're all going to, is this okay? You're okay? Look at that seat. That chair is beautiful. Uh, these chairs are wonderful. Look at this. So in the future, there's going to be a, these are very comfortable. There's going to be a hellscape. We're all going to live in a place like this. See this poor kid? This kid is in China. And in the places that they do this, this is basically a recycling center in China, uh, probably outside of Shenzhen. And this poor bastard has to go through all that cable and pull the copper out. And he burns off, or his dad burns off the plastic on that cable. And then they melt down the copper. And this kid just hangs out or he does some work, or it's just, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. This is a, this is a there used, there's things called brownfields, which are uh, ecological disaster zones, which can be reused. This is essentially a black field. It can't be reused. And this poor kid has to sit there and help his dad uh, survive, essentially, by sitting out in all this garbage. <clears throat> this is another vision of the future. It's ship breaking. It's, uh, it's the destruction of old stuff to make new stuff, which in turn is then destroyed to make new, more new stuff, which that poor kid has to take apart and make more new stuff. It's this endless cycle of consumption and creation and destruction. And, uh, and this might be what New York looks like in a couple years, once every, everybody figures out that they've got to tear down all the buildings to get more building materials. And all our kids are going to start looking like this kid, where they're all going to be taking pills and um, essentially staring into space and playing Minecraft in, in their heads while we yell at them because they're stupid. What's going on on the phone? Doing all right? Yeah, you got it? Everything's good? Yeah? Tell them, tell them, tell them say hi. Uh, you're like him. You see this? You're addicted. So we're all going to be addicted to this stuff, right? It's going to be a mess. Essentially, the future is going to be horrible. Everything's going to be terrible. We're all going to die. And it's the worst possible outcome for all of us, right? Everybody's it's just awful. Yes? Yay! No? no. <laughs> Absolutely not. So this is an interesting story that everybody tells when it comes to dystopias and bad futures. This is Bleecker Street, actually Morton Street in New York, 1893. And all that stuff up there, that's horse shit. And in 1893, every major city in the world, around the world, had this problem. They were convinced that every city was going to go up to, the, what, up to the first floor, up to the stoop, in this horse shit. In some cases, you would actually get up to right about there, right where the stairs were, and you wouldn't even have a sidewalk. You'd just be walking in feces the whole time. It was the whole world was, it was the whole world was going to look like this. It was going to be an absolute mess. <clears throat> they had uh, they had meetings. They ar they argued this for hours and hours, days and days, months and months. 
there was no solution. They figured they were just going to have to destroy Paris, destroy New York, and move. They were going to go to, I don't know, Wisconsin and rebuild New York. Then, in about 1910, this came along. And overnight, overnight, this problem went away. A technological solution, which in its own way caused its own problems down the line, uh, destroyed the biggest problem on people's minds in 1893. It was a complete and utter change in the way we thought about travel, in the way we thought about movement, in the way we thought about our cities. Before, we had this. Now we have this. It's clean combustion. Look at these handsome people on their, on their Model T trundling off into the, into the woods. What did I do? Shit. Uh, trundling off into the woods, enjoying themselves. And we came to a point where that horseshit problem wasn't a problem anymore. But it looked like the hugest problem in the world. It looked like everything was going to be destroyed. It was a dystopia, a horseshit dystopia, which would have been amazing. I would have wanted to have been there. So I would argue that the street finds its own uses for things. This is what William Gibson said. He's an author, and he writes science fiction. He writes dystopian science fiction. And most of the stuff that he's written about is this concept of technology changing the way we work and live and exist in human meat space. And the street finds its own uses for things means that all the problems that we see today are eventually going to be solved with massive changes in technology in the future. That's what techno technotopia is about. I'm actually an optimist. I have to be a techno-optimist. If I'm not, then I'm going to kill myself because my kids and my, I have to take my family with me. Because everything that we see right now looks like the horseshit problem. But I would argue that down the line, we're going to be able to solve this problem extremely well with technologies that we don't even understand yet. So I'm going to show you a few of those technologies, and I'm going to give you another example of a fun thing that you can share at parties, and then we can go and eat some food. <clears throat> so in terms of health, here are some of the uh, horseshit problems that we're dealing with right now. This is a blind woman. And what she's wearing is called an eye port. And she puts it on, you puts it on your, on your eyes, and you hold this little thing on your tongue. And that thing right there sends an electrical charge to this woman's tongue for an extended period of time. It's sort of a wave of, a wave of electricity that she can feel. And for the first couple days when you wear this thing, there, there are cameras in those glasses. The first couple days when you wear this thing, the all you feel is just a buzz on your tongue. It feels really weird, but it's not really, a, it's not really an effectual thing. Then all of a sudden, you start seeing things. The tongue, thanks to neuroplasticity, becomes your optic nerve. And you can actually see things moving around. So what, one woman who tried this, uh, she used to walk down the streets of New York. And she would walk down the streets of New York alone. Because if you see a blind person coming towards you, you move out of the way. You don't want to deal with it. But now that she had these glasses on and she had this tongue thing in, she could actually feel people walking by her. They weren't afraid of her because she was just wearing dark glasses and she had something in her mouth, which was pretty weird. Uh, <coughs> but um, but the, in general, she could start feeling people move through and move around her. She could also feel color. So we are in a, we're in an era where blind people could see with their tongues. A hundred years ago, blind people were like Helen Keller. Uh, they couldn't do anything. They were stuck. Helen Keller changed that. She, Helen Keller improved the life of blind people everywhere. And ultimately, this is going to improve the life of almost everybody everywhere. Uh, direct neural inputs, which are extremely, extremely difficult, uh, obviously, are going to be our future. And it's a fascinating thing. I'm researching this right now. Furthermore, this poor bastard lost both his arms. And what he's wearing now is he's wearing two prosthetic arms that he can control with his mind and muscle movements around his back. So this is the, this is the first example of a uh, double amputee who's able to pick stuff up, move stuff around, and <coughs> control his environment with his brain, essentially. Very similar to the iPort, except this guy can actually interact with, the, with humanity again. This is all very clumsy. This all looks like junk. And if we showed this presentation to people 20 years from now, it would probably look about as primitive as the, as the horse shit situation in, uh, in New York in 1893. 
but this is important stuff. This is where we're headed. We'll be able to improve our lives considerably. Finally, this is my favorite thing ever. So if you're concerned about your weight, um, we all really should be, you could essentially eat poop and of a skinny person and you're going to be able to you're going to be able to get skinny again. So we're going to take all our take down our pants. Where's the skinniest guy in here? No, he's not here. There, no, I don't see anybody really really tall and like like lanky. You're pretty skinny. All right, so we're going to eat your poop. <laughs> that you you you're perfect. <laughs> I'm serious about this. This is this is this is goofy as shit, as, as, as shit but it's true. Um, fecal transplants are a new way of changing our internal biome. Fecal transplants are a new way of changing our internal biome, and it's going to be an important part of health and medicine, personalized medicine down the line. Uh, they did an actual test. A woman with Crohn's disease. Um, it's a digestive disease. Uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, you guys have it. Um, she did a fecal transplant with her daughter, who was obese, who was overweight. And her daughter didn't have Crohn's disease. So they did a fecal transplant. The mother got rid of the Crohn's disease, and that went away, but she suddenly became obese. So the human biome is affected by essentially the, the bugs and the, bio, and the, uh, and, and the uh, bacteria inside of it, which is fascinating. And it's going to be something that's happening down the line. So eventually we are going to eat skinny people's poop to get skinny. And it's, going to, and it's going to work, which is the scariest thing, but it's also going to do all kinds of other weird stuff to our digestive systems. You can also do this at home if you want. There are websites dedicated to it. It's a good, it's a, it's a good weekend project, really. There's, there's making a birdhouse, maybe going uh, motorbiking in the woods, and then eating, eating skinny people's poop. Oh, Jesus, that would be awful. Anyway, furthermore, we have artificial intelligence. So first we're talking about humanity, humans actually doing stuff. Now we're talking about robots doing stuff for us. Now our vision of AI is, a, is like Hal coming down and pushing us out of the airlock and we're all going to die. For all intents and purposes, maybe down the line, yeah, we're all going to be killed by AI. It's entirely feasible. Maybe there's a car, maybe the Google car becomes self-aware and wants to drive around and kill us all. <laughs> but let's, let's assume for a moment that it doesn't happen. What's really going to happen is we're going to free up the minds that are sort of dedicated to what we would argue are professional, professionally boring tasks. Accounting, law, research, um, in some cases journalism. Um, we're going to have an entire group of college graduates who aren't going to be able to go into finance because there's going to be robots doing finance for them. We're going to have entire entire... Uh, swaths of college graduates who aren't going to legal and law and uh, research because robots can do it for them. This is a, com this is a company up in uh, Canada. It's essentially a robot that does legal research for you. You say, I need all the information about X, Y, and Z, and it'll give you that information in a very detailed process and basically give you documents that you can use to assist your, assist your legal case. It's the same thing that a paralegal would do, and, um, and it's a lot faster, and it's essentially cheaper because this robot's going to do it for you. Then we got these self-driving cars. I did, a, I, did a, I did an article recently about Uber's self-driving car. So think about it. What's going to happen when we have self-driving cars everywhere? We're going to have an entire class of people who are out of a job. You're going to have a surly taxi driver who cannot no longer be surly in his taxi anymore. He's going to have to find something else to do. And this is actually happening. In Pittsburgh right now, uh, at the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute, the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute, which is a university there, is empty. Uber bought every single person in the Robotics Institute uh, to work for their self-driving car project. Every single one. That would be the equivalent of like, of I don't know, Estimote buying everybody in everybody in the in the Wrocław School of Engineering or something like that picking everybody out, putting them all in one room and saying, here, build us a self-driving car. It's frightening in that respect because Uber's goal here is to put taxis out of business. Google's goal is to maybe put us, make us a little safer in their little goofy little marshmallow cars. But Uber's goal is to say, 
all right, all you taxi drivers, if you don't play by our rules, we're going to screw you by creating an army of self-driving cars that are going to drive around the world. It's a frightening thing, and it's a perfect example of the street finding new uses for things. 50 years ago, 10 years ago, the public sector, a NASA or a NIH or any one of these government organizations would have been trying to do this. They wouldn't do very well at it because they're government organizations. Whereas the private sector can say, hey, let's send a bunch of stuff into space. And they do it, SpaceX or Elon Musk. And then the private sector can say, let's build an electric car or let's build robotic cars. And they do it. And they're, going, and they're building systems for these robotic cars and they're building systems for this whole, for all of these, uh, all of these uh, new creations that are completely separate from standards and practices accepted by most countries and governments. We're essentially, if we're, in a, if we're entering into a dystopia, it's going to be a corporate dystopia uh, where everybody does everything nice for us just because they can, I guess. Then finally, this is a quadcopter. But the best thing about this quadcopter is that it's actually controlled by a bee brain. So what they've done is they've simulated the brain of a bee and they plugged it into the quadcopter and they showed the quadcopter how to fly. And now the quadcopter has certain inputs and outputs and it flies just like a bee would. Unfortunately, this quadcopter, when they first tried it, the bee would keep on going to the left over and over again. So they couldn't quite figure it out. But for all intents and purposes, you could just stick a bee head up there and you'd have the exact same, <laughs> exact same uh, issue. But we're putting artificial intelligence, we're putting insect intelligence into robotics right now. Again, the street finds its own uses for things. This is an off-the-shelf quadcopter that any one of us could figure out. If we had an output of a bee brain, we could do exactly this in a couple minutes. Again, 10 years ago, we couldn't do this. All these parts would have cost tens of thousands of dollars. Today, uh, we could probably put this together in a weekend if we went down to the Gelda Elektronichna. Uh, furthermore, all this stuff, it's all going to be horrible, right? So everything's, everything's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm not saying that armed conflict isn't bad and that it, things are getting rosier and better. I, I can, in the States, it's pretty awful right now uh, in terms of people dying. But generally, armed conflicts are down. Um, this is from 1946 to 2004. We had a pretty shitty uh, decade, 1980 to about 1990. And right about now, it's all sort of, uh, it's all sort of going back down to almost pre-World War II levels. Greenhouse gas emissions. Again, it's not all rosy, and there's an entirely feasible that we're all going to end up living in a Blade Runner-esque uh, Los Angeles full of acid rain and, and uh, mutant ninja turtles. But it's going down. We're trying things to make things better. This is part of my Technotopia vision that things aren't as bad as they seem. And furthermore, this is median uh, life, essentially. Um, population, the, the, the time, of, like the, <laughs> the age of death. So Western Europe, you guys are doing pretty good. Asia's coming up. South Africa's kind of kind of eating it. Uh, but everybody else is constantly, in, uh, constantly uh, improving. Things are in train. I don't know. We suck. We're all dying of Doritos overdose. The way forward is not always clear, but it is a way forward. Uh, that's what we're looking at right now. We are in a horseshit moment, I would argue, in technology, in the environment, in culture, in social interaction, in aggression towards other human beings. The premise of my book is that if we're looking back at this day right now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we're going to chortle as we fly all around in our space cars how silly we were for thinking that things were really bad when it was completely obvious what the change was. Just as it was completely obvious in, 1890, in 19, 1910 uh, when the car came along and destroyed all the horse poop everywhere. The way forward is not always clear, but it is the way forward. And this is an interesting example that I'll take, I'll leave you guys with. This is a, uh, it's a Polish, it's a Polish meat product. It's sort of a tube. I don't know what you guys call it anymore. Uh, it's like a tubish thing. You can, there's meat inside of these tubes. Uh, 
Kielbasa, exactly. That's exactly right. You guys know your kielbasa. <laughs> this meat product is smoked, right? Smoking meats and cooking meats slowly has always been a big, big problem. Everybody enjoys a good smoked meat. Everybody enjoys a good turned meat. But how did you get meat? So this is a really interesting story about how something that is completely unconnected created something amazing. So we have these poor bastards right here. There's this dude up here basting the meat. There's this dude up here who's very upset with the meat. He's tasting it. And there's this poor guy over here in the red who has to turn this thing 24 hours a day so the kitten can have his, are those chickens? No, those are pigs. Yeah, that looks awful. Anyway, that's what you had to eat if you were back in the Middle Ages. And there was a problem with this picture because almost everybody in this picture was probably dead during the Black Plague. They were killed. So at that point, your meat smoking days are over because you don't have anybody to do the work for you. So you had to figure something out. And everybody had a lot of interesting ideas on how to fix this meat smoking problem. And it was a big problem. If you wanted a smoked meat, it's a, it's a delicious thing. It's a, hey, who doesn't love a smoked meat? Uh, you had the Black Plague, killed everybody. And so you had an interesting solution. So here's a, uh, here's a young lady. She's tending the fire. And you see this guy up here. Oh. This, is a, uh, this is a turnspit dog. And it's an actual breed of dog that was bred to stay in that cage and spin this meat over here. He, they would do it, they did it for centuries. These poor, these poor dogs were up there spinning meat <laughs> for people. This little guy was really enjoying himself. This woman's checking out the meat. And there's a cat who's doing literally nothing to make life better for anybody, except maybe he's getting the drippings. And this poor bastard has to spin and spin and spin and spin just to make sure that this ham tastes good for everybody. And I think there's a breastfeeding lady up there, which is, I don't know why you would do that literally under the dog's butt as it's spinning up above you, but whatever. They didn't have a lot of hygiene back then. So we could also understand, first you had the Black Death, then you had a dog that would spin meat for you, and if the dog died, then you kind of lost your thing. But at the same time, people had this idea. They realized that if you had a pendulum going back and forth, and you had a weight, you could essentially control the exertion of energy. You could control the output of energy in a system. In this case, this pendulum and this string that's wound around the gear is sort of the energy, the potential energy, and this is a regulator that keeps the energy from flowing out too quickly. So what does that give us? That gives us an excellent way to turn meat. You can, you can wind your thing up, you can get it started, you can let the dog go outside for once in its life. Uh, you can stop having the poor guy. Uh, you can stop having the guy spin, spin the meat outside with, uh, with the cook yelling at him. And you can regulate the energy that's exerted as you spin this meat. What did this lead to? This led to, eventually, something like this. This is the Marie Antoinette's watch. This is one of the most complex watches ever built. Sausages. And the desire for smoked meat, which all of us have deep in our hearts, do we not have this desire for smoked meat? Do we not want smoked meat all the time? Led directly to this. This deep desire for smoked meat led directly to this. And then it read, led directly to this. I would argue, as goofy as it sounds, this desire to improve our lives in some way uh, using technologies that are not abundantly clear how we're going to be able to use them is the absolute way forward. And as a technologist and as a lover of technology, <clears throat> and as lovers of technology, we have to appreciate that the things that we're building now are massively important for the future. And if we're not building something that is going to improve the future, we might as well just be putting a dog in a cage and having them spin meat for, for hours at a time and not getting anywhere. Go at it boldly, and you'll find unexpected forces closing around you and coming to your aid. Uh, be bold, and mighty forces will come to your aid, is how they say it. And this is essentially a new motto that I have. And as somebody who writes about technology, I can't be 
a pessimist. I can't be a cynic anymore. I have to look at this stuff and I have to look at it with an eye of what is this going to do for us in the future? Because the present's pretty shitty right now, I would argue. Uh, we're all happy here in this room, but there are plenty of people who aren't. Down the line, the technologies that we're building, the technologies that you guys are building, what are you guys building? These guys are making 3D printers. What are you guys building? What are you building? Anything? Well, tell me something that you're building. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll get back to you. What are you building? A website. All right, that's fine. Well, that's all right. What are you building? It's a smart kitty box. This is a smart kitty box guy. We know. I know this guy. What are you? What are you building? Can't tell openly we're patenting. Well, just, just, just give him an example. It's like you know, <laughs> there's nobody in this room. We're all friends. All right, what are you building? 3D printers. See, 3D printers. So you guys should talk. We're all building amazing things, and we're all desirous of making amazing things. We all want to change the world, and I think we are changing the world. That's the best thing. Uh, I didn't want to do a traditional startup pitch here. I didn't want to do a, how, to, how to pitch to startups, how to, how to make money or whatever. I wanted to do this because this is a lot more fun and this is a lot more interesting. And you got to see how sausages led directly to smoked meat, uh, led directly to Swiss watches. This is the information about me, uh, technotopia.cc. This is a work in progress. You are the guinea pigs. If you have, any, if you have anybody you know who is a futurist, who's talk, thinking about the future, I want to talk to them. So you can have them email me, john at bigs.cc or john at techcrunch.com. Um, anybody with an eye of the future, I don't care if they're making a kitty box or something else, just let me know and, uh, and we'll get them in the book. Thank you very much and, uh, well, yeah, you wanna go back? What'd I do? <coughs> anyway, thank you very much.